Hello and welcome back to Can I Make a Hit Podcast. The whole thread at the moment is all about whether as podcasters we could or should even become public speakers. Can we use that as a medium to help us publicise what we do to reach a bigger audience, get in front of people, get those clips, build our brand, all these different aspects. This is what I'm trying to find out. And in this thread, I'm going to be not only trying it myself, as I think you know already, I've put myself out to a couple of events. I've got booked for a couple of events. I'm actually going to try it and see whether it works for me to do it. But I'm also going to be speaking to a few public speakers as well to get their thoughts. Now, I thought it was really interesting because in my research, I found this chap called Liam O'Neill, who is doing a podcast and public speaking. And I thought, well, this really sums up what we're trying to do here. So what has he learned from that experience? What are the mistakes he's made? What are the good things he's learned? What can we get from that? And I'm absolutely delighted because he is actually joining us right now from Northern Ireland, from Omar. <laughs> good, well, good day to you, Liam. It depends what time people are watching this as to it. How are you doing? I'm very good, thank you. I'm very excited to be on the show. Thank you for asking me. Not at all. I, I'm so interested in what you can tell us about this because you've already made that jump. You know, you are a speaker and a podcaster. Uh, and just before we started, we were saying this thing is that at first I thought this was going to be very, very similar. I thought the only difference really with public speaking is you go in front of people and you have an audience instead of a microphone. But we were saying that's quite different. Yeah, the, I think the difference is whenever you're sitting behind a microphone is you're safe. Because you know you have control, you can edit, you can do whatever you want with it. You don't even have to post it if you want. Like the first time you walk out in front of a stage and there's actual people looking at you, expecting to be entertained or taught or whatever it is that you're there to do, that's a much different... In my experience, I'm lucky that I went the other way. I went from a speaker to a podcaster, but I've worked with a lot of people that have went from podcasting to to public speaking. So I think that that's the main difference is that there's energy in that room and you can feed off the people plus the lack of control that like you have as a podcaster. Podcasting, you control everything. Get out on the stage, not so much. Yeah. So, okay, well, let's just throw it in there straight away. The first question is, you know, this is a test I'm doing. Is it a stupid idea? Or do you think podcasters should actually look at public speaking potentially? I think it's a brilliant idea the way you're doing it because you're actually researching, looking, you're trying to develop and learn. What I think would be a terrible idea is if you just came on and said, I've been podcasting for X amount of years and tomorrow I'm going to be a public speaker. I think that would be bad. But the fact that what you're going to develop in that one talk, when you come back to your podcast, your audience will notice it, everything. Like it's really hard to visualize your audience if you've mm. never been part of an audience. So when I do my podcast, I'm not talking to the camera and talking and, and hoping people are listening. I see an auditorium of people reacting and moving. And, and that's why you'll notice I'm standing. I stand when I do everything because I stand when I talk on stage. So I imagine it being the same. So the way you're doing it, I think is awesome. That's going to like the, the thing that I'm really interested for is to hear about how like does it change you? Do you want to be a public speaker who has a podcast? I don't know yet. I mean, that's that's going to be a fascinating thing about it. I don't know whether yeah. I'm going to get... I mean, remember, this sadly is a virtual event being COVID, but it's still a conference, which they're going to be people watching me. And that's, yeah. that's in real time live. And I'm having to interact with them as well. I'm not doing a pre-recorded thing. So I'm going to have to do things like live polling and things like that, which is a totally different dynamic. But it's like one thing that I straight away got from watching loads of speakers so far, and this is how I started research on YouTube, is that people use a lot of stories, which you can use in podcasting, but I kind of get the feeling that in a live audience situation where you've got people who are sat there waiting for you to talk rather than more casually listening to a podcast, you can kind of get away with it more. And I've started trying to introduce a bit more stories into, into my podcast. And that, that was one big difference I found. Yeah. For, for me, everything I do is story-based. So I, I always will involve old, old stories from clients or from my life. But when you're in front of an audience, you can gauge it. Like I've cut stories off in the middle because I spot the audience and I go, this isn't hitting for some yeah. reason. And then, I, and then I'll say something. You have we segue lines. Like I'll say, and really the point of that leads me to this. And then it's a completely different story unrelated to the first one, but it's not recorded. It doesn't matter. They forget it and they remember the good one. Mm -hmm. Like with podcasting, you've probably done this yourself because I know I've done it lots of times. You start your podcast with, Welcome to this episode of the what? Which episode is this? 
four, like, and then you start <laughs> starting again. Whereas in real life, you, you don't have that luxury. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah you just got to keep going. Well, let, let's talk about you doing talks as well and some of the differences, because the first time I saw you was on a TEDx talk. And yeah. this was, you know, you demonstrated a point rather than just told people how to do something. And I would love you to share with people what you did. So I demonstrate the point of pain is a message from your brain to your body. And if you can control the way your body reacts to things, you can control the way your mind reacts. You can take more control of your body. So I, everything I do is about being superhuman. So as a male, the easiest way to demonstrate pain and control of pain is to have something really painful happen. So on my TEDx talk, my brother comes on stage and if you are thinking about doing a talk, watch my brother. He'd never been on stage before. He doesn't know anything about stage fright. He doesn't know anything about how nerve wracking it is. He looks like he's just walking through the shop. Mm -hmm. And then I get him to stand in front of me and he gets to kick me as hard as he wants in the groin. And then I <laughs> continue. He walks off stage <laughs> delighted and I continue to finish my talk and explain that mind over matter is an actual thing so rather than taking the whole point is instead of me taking 15 minutes to describe that i just go i can describe it or i can do it you kick me in the groin there we go it's really interesting i mean i, I found it absolutely hysterical and i will link to that video as well because it's fantastic um but it's the fact that if you do that in front of a live audience you're going to get a very different dynamic to if i did that on a, a vlog or, well, you couldn't do it on an audio podcast because it wouldn't make sense to. So how yeah. how have you kind of learnt to move between the two mediums to take exactly the same point, which is about pain and sort of understanding about overcoming it, but dealing with it in two very different ways? Can you give us some of the idea of the differences? So I, the way I looked at it was, it's all in your mind. Your mind creates the physical reaction. So yes, there's pain, but how intense the pain is, is going to be created by how much focus you put on it. So I started to think, how would I elicit physical reactions out of people by talking to them? The kick in the groin is a good story because any males listening will feel it. They'll go, and then they'll go watch it because they're like, I can't be that hard. And then we'll see this fact that he does it. So one of the easiest examples I use is I get people to imagine they're holding a lemon. Imagine you're holding a lemon and then imagine you bite into the lemon and you taste yeah. it. And as I'm telling that story now, your mouth sort of gets more mm. saliva in it. So, mm. so things like that start to started to become um, part of the way I would tell stories. So rather than just saying, I like the time I nearly got mugged, rather than me saying I was walking down an alleyway and I was in this situation and, and two guys came and two guys tried to mug me and I talked my way out of it. And then I got out into the open. It's not very interesting. But if I say, like, have you ever made the mistake of walking down somewhere you've never been before? Mm. I did this. I ended up walking down behind a train station because it was shorter. Mm. And then have you ever met two people come out of the dark or even think that someone's come out of the dark, but in fact, it's just a bush or, or a bin or something. Then you, you've had all that panic. So you're going through this story and journey with me. So rather than me just telling you about my experience, I'm asking you to experience it by remembering times where something happened that would be sort of the same so not everybody nearly got mugged or talked their way out of a mugging but everyone has seen something at night and and sort of panicked and then they get up to it and it's just some trash or it's like a tree and they're like oh, it's freaking out there so if you start to understand that then you can elicit that in the people that are listening so rather than you just listening going oh that guy did some cool stuff like even the way you asked me about the kick in the groin Rather than just saying to you, oh, I got kicked in the groin in my TEDx talk, so it was great, you should watch it. <laughs> I talk about pain and the only way that, the easiest way for a male to feel it. So people are starting to connect the dots. And they're going, he's not talking about being kicked in the groin. And then you're, so you're bringing them into the journey. Yeah. And that's why I think I'm lucky in the fact I went from stage to podcast because you know you have to be more, you, as much energy as I bring to the stage, I bring more when I talk on a podcast because you have to, to get it across to the to the to the listener, to the viewer, whichever it is. So, um, yeah. it's it, it is interesting though that that whole 
energy aspect because when I started watching those speakers, now definitely there are some speakers that connect with you better than others, but the mm. ones that do well, they hook you in and you do not realize that 30 minutes is gone. You know, you're, you're absolutely drawn into it. And I think certainly when you're starting the podcasting, this is something that I've really tried to, to learn how to do engagement techniques and I've tried different things in, in what I'm doing to do this, is that there's clearly a huge amount we can learn from speaking in terms of how we present a podcast to keep people hooked. Because, it's, you know, it's, as I say, it's so much easier. When, you, when you're sitting in an audience, you can't just get it. Well, you can get up and go to the toilet. But on a podcast, you can just press stop. You can, you can be gone in a second. So if you don't grab people, you've lost them, don't you? I like the way you put it was when you present. So you think of it like presenting, whereas lots of people talk about doing a podcast. Yeah. So if you're just doing it, then you're not trying to present. You just, oh, I have a podcast. I do a podcast. I record a podcast. You present the podcast. So the yeah. word present already from a linguistic standpoint makes you more you know you're trying to deliver to an audience mm. and like you're saying there that people can pause it but more often than not not people are doing other things mm. one of my favorite messages to get is i started listening to your podcast when i was cleaning the car or when i was cleaning the kitchen the podcast was over and i thought to myself i haven't cleaned anything <laughs> because they stopped they, they, yeah they started they get sucked into the story and they stopped and they watch they listen to the story or they watch the youtube and they're like oh, that's amazing and then it's over and then they're like i was meant to be cleaning as i did this so most podcasts i know i do it i stick a podcast on and train or i stick a podcast mm -hmm. on and do something mm -hmm. so you're not trying to just keep them engaged you're almost trying to pull them away from that other task that you're you're there with them doing which again, if you remember that, then you can add that to your podcast. You can say things like, I know that you're probably tidy in the kitchen at the minute, at the minute, but this is a point that you should really stop and listen to. Or I know that you're driving your car. If I was driving, I'd pull over and listen to this. It's really important. So again, you're you're the say 10 people are listening, five of them driving the car will go, will go, he's talking right to me. Mm. The five that aren't driving the car will just listen anyway because it's a bit of a hook. But because you know this sort of stuff's happening, you can add that in. Like if I, I come into, I've went to do talks and the place is freezing. I bring it up immediately. I come in and say, like I wear a, a custom made suit when I'm on stage. Now, I didn't back at the TED talk, but I do now. So I will come on and say, I got, good job, these are custom made because they have inlays, will be heaters in them, this place is Baltic. <laughs> yeah. and you're just relaxing the audience. Yeah, and you're connecting straight away. Yeah. Yeah. Let's let's ask about then. Let's say you've never given a public speech before and you're a podcaster and you're really into your niche. You know, it could be, I don't know, it could be accounting, it could be history, it could be um, nature, it could be, uh, you, know, you name it. How do you think people can take their topic and start thinking about how they could deliver a speech about it? I mean, how could they mentally start to make that transition? What would be the first step do you think they should try? For me, it would be going back to how they got into it, why they love it. Mm -hmm. People forget that you, they, that they don't people don't know your background, so you just starting to go. Like I have a lot of knowledge on, say, martial arts. I've been doing twenty years of it, but if I just start saying one of the greatest things I think people should learn is kung fu because it's really good for you, you'll go All right. Yeah. Whereas if I say I remember being a child and watching Jackie Chan movies and thinking he's a he's an actual real life superhero he can fly and climb over. i want that's what i want to be so i'm going to find out how to do that and then so now i'm engaging with you in a way that i'm i'm letting you into me the way i, I would get people to look at comedians as well because a speaker can go on stage and speak for 20 minutes and you know nothing about their life a comedian can speak for two minutes and you know every intricate detail of them so you feel more connected yeah so find out remind yourself why you got into it what you love about it and then deliver that, deliver your passion and your love for it to inspire me to like look into it. If you just tell me how it helped your life and, and you really liked it, which a lot of people do, I, if I am just sitting in the audience, I can't really engage with that because that's your life. Whereas if you say it's, it helped me and when it helped me, martial arts really helped me. I started to feel better about myself. And one of the things I noticed really quick was when I trained with other people from all walks of life, they felt better as well. So there I've just engaged the audience, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. 
not only me, but everyone I met who did this loved it. And then I would say practice. Mm. Don't practice sitting down, writing your, write out your wee speech and, and read it to yourself and you're not engaging with anything and you're like, yeah, no, that sounds really good. I get up, I have a full length mirror and I get up and I talk to the mirror and then I go, I didn't really like the way that fit. And then I'll change someone and I'll do it again. So I'm breaking it down each time. And then if you're lucky like me, you know the people, the town I live in, I know most of the people that own the buildings. I get into the place that I'm going and I do my speech by myself. I wander about in a video with, I look back and I go, like say simple stuff, like I was talking about the future, but I was pointing to the past. Why was I doing that? Because mm -hmm. I'm not engaged with, I was kind of nervous. So now I know where I need to put my hands when I talk. So find out why you love it and really engage with that for yourself. And that will come across. Then practice, like practice. Mm -hmm. Practice is so important. And people, people are so nervous and scared of doing it wrong that they don't practice, which isn't <laughs> going to help matter. This is going to make it worse. So they would be my two main areas. And then the third one would be like, we've already talked about a few times, build it into a story. Mm. So you, I would start my story and then give a bit of my background and speech and then the middle of my story and the background and speech and then end with my, my story. Mm. Like if my TED talk was called Limitation is a Mirage. The whole thing was based around that. One, because it spells my name, but two, I was in the midst of writing a book so it was coming out in the future. So when it was coming out in the future, I was saying, like, you go back to this talk, that's how I, I project everything forward. And I'm like, well, my book's going to be called Limitations and Rise. But I make a joke about it as well with mm. my mom being so prepared 34 years ago that she she knew my talk was going to be limitations and rise, so she called me Liam to be ready for that. You know, I, I think actually, if we go to the web page, we've probably got that. That is the book there, isn't it? Yeah, I'm looking well, at that. I've the cover since then, I just really oh. so I need to update that. Uh, it's on Amazon as well, so it's on Amazon anywhere in the world you can you yeah. can get it on Amazon. Um, and I think it's 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 an audiobook and a Kindle, so that, that's another crossover because I did so many podcasts. I was like, well. I want to be a speaker and a podcaster. I want my book to be audible. So I better read it myself. Yeah. So, there's, so there's, there's some fantastic tips there then. So if people try this, if people try and put together a talk, practice, find an opportunity to go and give it, what benefits might they get as a podcaster trying to promote what they're doing? Why, why do it in simple terms? If you, for me personally, I would look at what I benefit first before my podcast what i benefit is the experience of speaking to real live audience will give you such a better understanding of what it's like to speak to a camera and to a microphone you will like you'll see it yourself once you do it when you come away your next podcast will, will just feel so much better so you'll feel so much better doing it you'll have a better understanding of the the way to interact with an audience and then because of that more people are going to engage with you more people are going to um, post about it. like my talks are the reason people listen to my podcast like because I like to challenge myself as well when I started my podcast I did a podcast a day for a year mm -hmm. without fail but I said on the podcast my challenge is to not release a podcast a day a year because I could just do seven on a Sunday it, it was to actually sit down and record it every single day Whenever people would contact me about the podcast, they would always say, I saw you in, and they would name the place, and you mentioned the podcast, so I went to listen to it, so they're getting more on it. But also, because you're speaking, you can start a story or tell a bit of a story and say, I actually go really in-depth in that in my podcast from last week, or my, my next podcast is based on this, or something. You can, you can promote it that way. You're building, you're building your brand, and you're a person. So the people, now the people listening to my podcast, they see a guy who moves about and talks and like is energetic. They don't picture me sitting behind a microphone going, hello, how's it going? <laughs> I'm, I'm animated as I go. So they see that as well. So they, they would be the main things I've noticed with people who have made the transition. Yeah. But So it's branding and it's it's learning 
what people are almost reacting like when you tell your stories and when you're talking about your topic. And it'll give you a better sense. I guess next time you go in front of the microphone, as you say, you can imagine them now. You're not just talking at a piece of metal with a bit of foam over the top of it. You're actually yeah. talking to real people. It's yeah. going to be so interesting to see what kind of... I mean, it is such a shame this is going to be a virtual event, the one I'm doing, but... It's still just the whole thought process behind it is, is already starting to teach me stuff. And I think it is absolutely fascinating. It, it's interesting. You made this point about um, knowing who your audience are. And it's so I'm talking about podcasting. But the first thing I did was I went onto the event website and I, I literally copied and pasted the website into a Google Doc. And then I cut out all the waffle down to what the event was about. And then I thought, well, how could I demonstrate or answer each of those points? So they're talking about innovation, technology in speaking, how this can help speakers over the next two years and stuff like this. And I thought, well, how can I illustrate each one of those points? And by the end of this, I'd pretty much come up with a talk just by answering their questions off the website. And hopefully, if that's what the event is about and that's what they know their market wants to hear... Hopefully, I'm then going to connect what I say with it. We, we will find out. They, might, you know, when they give me a score of zero out of ten, I'll know I didn't do it right. But um, fingers crossed. That's well, the principle. Already, for me, already you're getting a ten out of ten because you did what most don't. Most go and book for a talk, and you're like, "What's the talk about?" Oh, I'm just going to talk about this. Now, what's the event about? I don't know. Whereas you went down, looked at the event, and went, "Well." Because it's, it's not for me, it's not, again, it's not just the people that are hiring you in for the event that are going, oh, he's answering our questions. The people who are coming to listen to this event have read that same thing yeah. and they go, yeah. oh, I would like to know about that. I would like to know about that. And then you yeah. come along and, and teach them about that. Yeah. You're, you're going to be the guy that they go, that, that guy was amazing. I think he could really help me. I'm going to reach out to him. And I know he's got a podcast because he said it <laughs> a, few, a few times. But again, I know you've crossed your fingers, but most people are fully crossed everything. <laughs> your hope. If you're already learning and, and trying to deliver what the audience wants to hear, most people will just go and do their talk and mm. force a talk down people's, this talk is about this. And you're like, but we're here for, like, I would go on that as well, do the exact same thing. And I would go and talk about technology. My, but I would still bring it into my life and what I, what I do and, and how I, I would inter, still integrate that. But I know the reason that they're there is technology or yeah. whatever the, the three points are that, that's on the thing. So you're already way ahead of the audience because the audience have an expectation of what's going to be said at this talk. And you've prepped a talk based on that expectation. That's perfect. Instead of landing with a talk that you made up, mm -hmm. 10 months ago, and that's your talk. And you go in and you go, I've got my talk. And they're like, yeah, but we want you to talk about innovation. And you're going, no, I want to talk about squirrels. Yeah. I need to talk about squirrels, and it's really good. They'll love it. You know, it doesn't make any sense. So. You know what, Liam? I We are coming up to the end of that 25 minutes, and I feel I could talk to you for several hours. I would love to check in with you. I mean, I'm, it's a month and a half until I do this talk, but I'd love to check in with you once I've done it to sort of, yes. you know, run by you again what you, you what I feel I learned from it and get your experience on that as well and what we can then pass on to podcasters from my experience, uh, you know, and, and those examples of what I had. It would be awesome to do that. Yeah, I'd love to do that. That would be great. Liam, yeah. thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. The usual yeah. question, if people want to find out more, I mean, we already showed them that, that website there, and I'll put the links in the show notes as well and on the social media too, but where can people find you? If they just look up the Prove It Guy, they'll find me everywhere. I'm, I'm on everything as the Prove It Guy. That's, yeah, everywhere. So that's Liam, it, it was such a pleasure talking to you. I, as I say, I feel... There's so much more we could be saying, but is there a final message to podcasters thinking about public speaking? Yeah, definitely do it. Go out and do it. But when you come back as a podcaster, remember that real people need time to answer your questions and aren't afraid of silence. Don't just keep rambling over your questions. And then limitationism arise, do whatever you want. 
Superb. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much to Liam O'Neill for joining us today. As I say, I'm going to be talking to a few more public speakers as well to get their perspective on this whole test, this whole project that I'm trying to do at the moment to see what they think about it as well. I've got an event organiser coming on as well, hopefully in the next couple of weeks too, as well from the perspective of what they want from us if we want to try and pitch a talk to them as well. So lots of interesting stuff. I will keep you up to date with all the developments and lots more also about other aspects of podcasting as well. So it's not just about public speaking and covering all kinds of aspects. And I'm going to be looking a lot more into social media techniques as well with some podcasters that I've been talking to who are absolutely killing it online. I'll speak to you very soon.